Neuroscientist Mark Lewis says the disease model of addiction isn't just wrong, but that it has become an obstacle to healing. And he details it all in his new book. It is called The Biology of Desire. And with that, we welcome Mark Lewis to our studio. Hi. Hi there. Welcome back. I, you haven't been here for a couple of years. New book out. Yeah, Way to go. Two years, new book. Okay, so this book is all about addiction, and it, it, it approaches it somewhat differently from, mm -hmm. from the normal ways we're used to talking about addiction. So let's really start at the beginning. How do you sure. define addiction? Okay, so the subtitle of the book, The Biology of Desire, Why Addiction is Not a Disease. And that's really, that's the theme. Although I use, I use stories of, of people's addictions in quite a lot of detail to tell the human story, but I also tell the neuroscientific story. And the, the basic message, the disease model is very, it's very prominent. Uh, and uh, it comes from doctors and psychiatrists and scientists at NIH, which funds 90% of the addiction research in the National world. National Institute of Health. Right. Yeah. And so it's a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because you don't bite the hand that feeds you in, in the funding world. So people keep looking at cellular mechanisms and saying, okay, well, this is wrong and this is different. And actually what's happening is the brain is changing in addiction. And it changes a lot in addiction. But it changes a lot when you learn anything that is profound and intensely motivating. You, the brain changes when you get married or when you fall in love or when you have kids or when you become a religious fanatic or when you become a sports fan because the brain is supposed to change. Okay, I, there's, there's so much that you've just said in that one minute there, Mark. So I, well, let's break down. We'll talk about how the brain changes with addiction. But, okay, if, if addiction is not a disease, mm -hmm. what, is, what it? is it? What is it? That's the question. It's a learning phenomenon. It's an intense, deep habit which is developed like any other habit through learning. I mean, that's how we develop our habits. And some habits become deeply ingrained. Uh, often habits of relationship become d deeply ingrained. So when we fall in love and we have a partner, and those habits are they're, they're there for a long time, even for life. Even after, if you've had a separation, they're still there. Um, in addiction, the, the habits have to do with seeking a particular substance or activity, and we have to recognize it's not just about drugs and booze, it's also gambling and sex addiction and porn addiction and eating disorders. Quite a few eating disorders also cross into the uh, definition. So what you're learning is a particular way of conceptualizing what's rewarding, conceptualizing this is what I need, this is what I want, this is what I have to do, this is what makes me feel okay. And when that repeats over and over again, driven by strong emotions, because there's strong emotions, and that as partly what drives the repetition, you're building synaptic networks. As I say, that happens in learning in general. So it's learned behavior. So yeah. let's, we accept that as a premise, that's the premise that you put forth. Yeah. You, in your book, talk about three models of addiction, disease, choice, and self-medication. So we yeah. talk a little bit about disease. Let's talk about uh, choice and self-medication. Often the choice model is put as the diametric opposite of the disease model. Either you have a disease and you can't help it, or you have a choice and you can't help it, and it's basically your own fault. Um, that's way too simplistic. The choice is not objective, it's not rational, it's not logical. A lot of the, I just, I just, you know, riding in the taxi on the way here, we made so many choices that were not logical, right? <laughs> Meaning you got lost, uh, yes. You, you got lost, <laughs> and should we take this street, or that? too many cars there, let's go this way, and choices like that. So the, the mind is not very often rational, and we often do things because of context, associations, motivation, mood, all these things affect our choices. So yes, addiction is a choice to a degree, but it's a choice that is um, constrained by deep learning and associations and strong emotions. So the, and the third model, self-medication. Yeah. I keep going? Keep going. Keep going. The, uh, I, I buy that. I think that that corresponds with the learning model quite well because self-medication means that people who've experienced often neglect or rejection or trauma or other psychological uh, nastiness in their early years, childhood and adolescence, they come out depressed and they come out anxious. Um, or they have PTSD. I mean, it can be clinical or it can be subclinical, but one way or another, they're not feeling good. They're not feeling happy. They're not feeling whole. They're not feeling complete, and so they try stuff, and something makes them feel better, and that's that's self-medication. Mm. You keep on trying it, and you keep on doing it because it keeps making you feel better, and presto, you're addicted. All right. So you started off this conversation about talking um, about how the medical establishment prefers to see the addiction as a disease, and yeah. the, the self-interest of that for them. It's not entirely self-interest. I mean, these are sincere people, generally, who really see it that way. 
my training was in developmental psychology. So I see a lot of mental and emotional phenomena as developmental, as arising out of childhood. These guys are doctors and psychiatrists. They, they see things in terms of pathology. And, ter and pathology is approached through diagnostic categories. So you put something in a category, and we have the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, which says, OK, if you have this, 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 and this, then you have a substance use disorder. So that's the way they think. It's not that they're you know, some uh, uh, evil clan, but um, there are harmful effects, I think, quite harmful effects, especially in the treatment community. Like what? The disease model is the basic flagship of, of uh, it, it's the banner waved by most rehab centers throughout North America, throughout the world. Uh, they say, this is a disease, you have a disease. Uh, the NIH defines it as a chronic brain disease. Well, what do you do when you have a chronic disease? You have to go and get it treated. So they bring people in the door, and this is where the problem is. They're charging sometimes vast amounts of money, 10 to 100,000 bucks a month in the US, even more. And then the person is sent home after 30 days or 60 days, and they're back in their lonely little apartment in Pittsburgh or where Guelph, and, and they start using again. So there's a very serious revolving door problem. People come back to rehab again and again and again and again. And part of the reason for that is that the whole conceptualization of treatment is just wrong. I want to talk about the person at the center of this. We talk about drug addiction and treatment so much, we rarely talk about the addict, him or herself. True. When we apply the disease model, that approach to it, is that useful for the addict to, no. to look at it that way? No. I, I, I get emails like several times a week. I got one this morning saying, thank you so much. I never felt like I had a disease. Uh, I felt like I was, I was cursed for life because I could never get rid of it, and I felt like I could never be free of it. And truly, I, I'm not trying to boast. I'm just trying to say that this, this, is, this is a dynamic. This is a so phenomenon. what did this person tell you it they felt said, like to them? It felt wrong to be told I had a disease. It felt, it felt encumbering. It felt like, like being chained down to, uh, to a disease a diagnostic label. And the idea of chronicity, and this is partly reinforced by the 12-step programs, which tell you you have to keep controlling and fighting this thing for the rest of your life. Well, she didn't feel happy about that. She thanked me for the book. She says, your model makes me feel free and happy, and I feel I have done the things I need to do. I can go on with my life. I don't have to carry this weight with, with me. They're very touching. Mm. I get that a lot. You get that a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's self-selecting. Obviously, mm. the people who don't agree probably aren't going to email me. But mm. for her and for many of the people that I talk to, I, I talk to thousands of addicts through my blogging and emailing and stuff. And, a lot of them don't feel they have a disease, and they, they feel the weight of that diagnosis as being counterproductive because they don't feel, I can't, I can't get over it. It's not. It's a burden. It's a them. burden, yeah. I have to do what I'm told by the doctors, so you become a patient, which means you become passive. When you're passive, you do what you're told. You do what an authority tells you to do, and there are only a few medications, actually, that are available and that do anything at all. But the, the most important thing for recovering from addiction is, is self-empowerment is being able to feel like I can change my life. I can do this. And that, I think, gets really, really quashed by the, uh, the whole disease philosophy. Right. OK. I want your neuroscientist. Um, I want to talk about the brain. And, that, and you, you tipped your hat to that earlier. Mm -hmm. There has been much research about what is going on physiologically in your brain when mm -hmm. you are addicted mm -hmm. to drugs. Tell me about what you have learned, about what is happening. I'm on drugs. I'm addicted to drugs. I'm an addict. Mm -hmm. What's happening in my brain? Um, what's happening is that when you get any kind of cues or stimuli or memories or imaginations about cocaine or alcohol or getting a drink or sex or gambling or whatever it is, uh, you get dopamine, a particular neuro, neuromodulator, neurotransmitter, comes up from the midbrain, goes up to a place called the striatum, which is a very old part of the brain designed for seeking goals. And it focuses attention. It collapses attention into a kind of a narrow beam. And it produces motivation, attraction, a push toward the goal, because that's how we mammals you know, achieve our goals. So uh, the stri each time that happens, the striatum gets wired up a little bit more, because all brain regions, when they get used, you get synaptic changes. You get changes in the synapses. The synapses that are used get strengthened. Mm -hmm. The synapses that are not used get weakened. So the ones that correspond to the drug or drink or whatever, gambling, whatever it is, those synapses become more and more in, 
and trained, connected, reinforced, strengthened. You get these highways that continually get reinforced by the dopamine uptake. And that's basically all you can mm. think about. That's what I need, that's what I want, that's all I can think about. Your brain, the rest of your brain shuts off. It doesn't shut off entirely, but some of the other things that you used to become, you used to be very uh, um, attracted to, your pets, your family, your mm. uh, movie night, pizza, whatever, is just falls off the edge because you're not pursuing those things very much. So the synapses that are representing those activities become weakened. And so in that sense, yes, there's less of the rest and a lot of focus on this one thing. All right, Mark, if that's what is happening inside a, a, an addicted brain, that sort of trap door almost that keeps you really focused, yeah. is the same thing happening um, in my brain if I use drugs recreationally, that those synapses shutting down, the ones that we're firing being fired more often? Yeah, it, it, it's complicated. Um, it's, <laughs> the course, it's the brain. It's the brain. The other thing that happens in addiction is the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part, uh, becomes less connected when you're pursuing drugs. Why? Because the behavior becomes automatic. With any automatic behavior, driving your car, uh, whatever it is, you're not, you don't need to think. And so there's a kind of a shutdown of some of these synaptic pathways as well, um, which means you lose perspective. And that loss of perspective is, is, is really an insidious thing. When you lose perspective, you're really only living for the moment and you're not able to sort of see the future and not able to think about how this is worth it, you know, because next week I'm just going to be in the same situation. When people use drugs recreationally, that's not happening. It's just none of it is happening. I mean, they use drugs recreationally like people do social drinking. It's, the, it, it's one of, a, of, of, of an ensemble of rewards that you can, you Except can enjoy. Except for many people, isn't there that, you know, that, 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 that line that, you, you know, you start recreationally and then it leads to addiction. I mean, so where does your brain switch? The stats show that uh, about 85% of people who use drugs don't get addicted. 85%? I mean, yeah. Okay. Don't get addicted. Okay. So, um, of those who do get addicted, and they're the ones we worry about, of course, uh, most of them get better. The majority get better. Um, and of those who get better, the majority of those get better without formal treatment. And these stats are all available online. They're, mm -hmm. I'm not making it up. Okay. So it, although addiction is insidious and dangerous and it destroys lives, and we have to, of course, think of better and better ways to, to help addicts, um, it's not like this evil curse that descends on you like in Snow White and, you know, it's uh, suddenly you're asleep for 100 years. It's not, it's not magical. Mm -hmm. I like that you're mixing up your fairy tales, by the way, but that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, I want, but you, so I, I, I don't recall the stats that you just put out, but a, a number of people statistically recover yes. from drug addiction. Yes. It's that word I want to focus on because, and I want to stick with the brain. If your brain does that when you're addicted, what is happening to your brain when you're in recovery? Good question. You continue learning. The first thing that happens is that the, the thing that you're attracted to becomes repellent. Okay. And, and that can happen, obviously, in, a, in stages. I mean, it, it may take time. This is wrecking my life. This is wrecking my marriage. This is getting me in all kinds of trouble. I'm starting to hate this. I do it every day. It's boring. It's stupid. It's disgusting. I want to stop. I want to be free of it. Now you have a new desire, a desire to move in another direction, and you have less desire over there. As those scales rebalance, uh, you start to learn methods for self-control that you haven't used for a long time, perhaps. So again, it's synaptic wiring, right? Mm -hmm. It's always synaptic wiring. And some of the regions actually of prefrontal cortex that I was talking about before, those thinking regions, come online when the drug urge hits. So, okay, this is bad for me. Start thinking about something else. Okay, and now you're setting up a traffic flow again between the prefrontal cortex and the striatum, mm -hmm. that motivational part. And that traffic flow is starting to make you, uh, help you with all the skills and self-regulation abilities that you need to develop a, the habit of abstaining. Mm -hmm. And that's a habit too. So learned behavior to abstain. Yeah. Same, same approach. Yeah, it's a learned behavior. Um, I want to ask you about recovery. Yeah. It, I chose that word deliberately. Okay. Um, it's a word you don't, you're not fond of also when it comes to drug addiction. Why not? What's wrong with it? It's a medical term. <laughs> so disease, recovery, yeah. okay. Yeah, so recovery means you get back to normal. You go back to where you were. People who uh, overcome their addictions, a word that I prefer, 
um, they're not going backwards, they're going forwards. They're developing new skills and uh, new ways of understanding themselves, new perspectives. They often look back on a period of suffering and say, I'm glad I went through it. I'm a deeper, fuller person. I understand myself better now. I know my limits and I know where I want to go and who I want to be. So I don't think of it as recovering and going mm. backwards. I think of it as further development, growth. 